Okay, so per y'all's request, we're going to talk about sleep today. Now, this topic um, goes a lot deeper than what you may see any information about in the book. So majority of this information, if you want to go look further at any resources or any additional articles, that would be these two links down here. The IFM is the Institute for Functional Medicine. So a lot of the information that I'm gonna be talking about today, I actually got from the Institute for Functional Medicine. They have multiple articles in there that you can read regarding sleep. And then of course they have referenced all of them to the different studies. So you may hear me say throughout this particular presentation, this study shows. Um, so all of that information, resources where the studies are at can be found in the IFM. Um, Mercola has a lot of different sleep articles as well that I have used over the years. And then so any of the other stuff that I add in that isn't from either of those two is just from the things that I have done through clinical practice and the things from experience that I have seen work well for patients. So. This information is not going to be on the test. This is strictly for you guys to kind of have some benefit to know a little bit more about this topic and then give you some tools and some resources to use whenever you're trying to help other people with this particular problem. So as you can see, I put never underestimate the power of R&R and that R&R is not for rest and relaxation. That R&R is for repair and regenerate this is the time whenever your body actually will repair and regenerate is while you are asleep. There are way too many things that are going to be going on throughout the day that your body has to do in order for you to go through those different processes. So even whenever you're sitting still, there's still a lot of metabolic activity happening within your cells. So the repair and regenerate time is during your sleep. So as a definition, it's a very complex and active process of restoration for the body. And whenever we do not get sleep, it can result in physical as well as psychological disturbances that will certainly affect quality of life. So this kind of takes us back to our triangle that we have talked about before. Whenever we're looking at sleep, we have to definitely, definitely address all sides of the triangle so that we can make sure we're making a positive impact. Now, this may not be just a uh, do this and you will sleep good situation. Sometimes there has to be multiple approaches taken for different individuals to help them sleep. But here's a very important part that a lot of people don't realize. Whenever you do not sleep, whether that's enough hours, quantity, or deep enough quality, if you're losing sleep, then it's lost forever. So there is no such thing as I'm going to make up for it on the weekend and I'll just sleep for an extra three hours each night. That's not how it works. So there is no way to bank your sleep and then use it for a different day. Um, it's a daily thing and every single day your body's circadian rhythm says I need sleep in order to help repair and regenerate. So that's why you have cumulative effects that will continue to build and build and build um, on negative aspects of your health if you are losing sleep. So what systems are affected? Well, you can see here blood pressure, heart rates, we're talking cardiovascular, mental status, that means we're talking nervous, hormones, that means we're talking endocrine, and obviously immune system, we're talking lymphatic. So whenever you're looking at this, this is going to affect multiple different systems. And this is why it can cause a number of different signs and symptoms whenever people are not sleeping appropriately. Sleep deprivation is known to induce oxidative stress. So if you don't remember what oxidative stress is, that is the free radical generation in your body. If you're generating free radicals, then you are going to be um, really hurting your biochemical pathways. You're really going to be hurting your cells if you don't have the antioxidants there to cover those free radicals. So I put just a little note for you to remember, we've talked about melatonin through class, but melatonin is an antioxidant. So when you're not sleeping, you're actually generating free radicals, but whenever you are sleeping because your melatonin is there, you're actually fighting those free radicals. So very important to have that good quality sleep and that melatonin be released to help your body in multiple different systems. 
If you are sleeping less than seven hours, you're more likely to report 10 chronic health conditions, including depression, arthritis, diabetes, and asthma. Now, people don't always think, oh, respiratory system, asthma, that might have something to do with a lack of sleep. But again, if we have lots of oxidative stress in the body, it can impact things in a number of different locations. So now we now also see the respiratory system being pulled into this as well. Ultimately, sleep deprivation will lead to death. Obviously, they did this study on rats, and that doesn't always completely correlate to humans, um, but what they are showing is that if we sleep deprive these rats, they are more likely to die an earlier death. So when it comes to a big, huge thing in our society, anxiety, there is studies that will suggest that if you lose sleep, you are more likely, I believe it was 30% more likely, to experience anxiety the very next day versus someone who was able to sleep through the night. They didn't have those levels of anxiety, even in someone who was predisposed to that anxiety condition. Um, so very important for those patients as well, because there's so many people who think that they need to depend upon pills in order to help with their anxiety levels. Um, but there is lots of information that we can give them that's beyond the scope of pills, whether that is you need to make sure you're sleeping, you need to make sure you're eating healthy, because remember food and mood are directly correlated together. Um, and then of course, making sure that that person has good balance in all of their electrolytes is also important. Sometimes people who experience anxiety um, are really low, surprisingly, in sodium. So we've already learned the sodium potassium pump and, and we will learn even more in 2402 about how important sodium levels are and how they need to be maintained in the body. So sometimes I can even give an anxiety patient um, a prescription to have more salt and you would be surprised at how it actually helps their body. Now that's real salt, Himalayan sea salt. It's not that, uh, you know, Morton's bleached processed salt. That's not that. But that's because salt has so many different minerals in it. So there's a wide spectrum of minerals that you can get to help with those things. So if they're eating well, sleeping well, and taking care of their body, then that anxiety should definitely decrease. Brain scans show that there is increased activity within the amygdala. If you guys don't remember the amygdala, this is when we talked about the limbic system. It's the one that can make you very angry. It's the one that can um, cause you to have like road rage. So it's the emotional aspect of the brain, the limbic system is where that amygdala is found. And if you're not sleeping, then you are more likely to be emotional and doing things that maybe are not necessarily logical because your emotional brain is not healthy and well. So very important for um, people who feel like they're constantly in a state of flux with their emotions to make sure that they do sleep through the night. I always tell um, people feelings aren't facts. And that's very important for a lot of people to understand feelings aren't facts. We actually learned that from our pastor. And whenever we learned that, that actually changed a lot of things for us. You know, as females, we can get emotional if we lose sleep. We can get emotional if our hormones are off because of our cycle. We can get emotional when our kids don't do the right things. Um, but in regulating those emotions and looking at how we need to deal with them, it's very important to realize feelings aren't facts. And just because you feel some type of way doesn't necessarily make whatever you're feeling true and accurate. Um, it's important, may, may be even relevant in some situations what you're feeling, but not always factual. But we definitely see whenever you are sleep deprived, you're going to make emotional decisions that aren't always the best decisions. So another good reason to sleep. So here is the brain. Whenever we're looking at a relaxed brain, someone who does have the ability to get good quality sleep versus an insomniac's brain. And so basically what you're seeing on this brain scan is that there are different regions that are going to be more active on your relaxed brain than on the insomniac's brain. So you can see the areas are a little bit different as we look at them. Um, you can look at a different section over here as well. So you can see 
if there's different things that are going to be occurring, one of the things that's occurring is atrophy. You guys remember what atrophy means? To shrink, to decrease, okay? Atrophy of the parohippocampal gyrus, which is very prominent in insomniac. The HF stands for heart failure patients. So these insomniac heart failure patients have potential risk for cognitive impairment because if you are not sleeping, then the glands within or the organs within your brain start to get smaller and now they can no longer work appropriately. For this parahippocampal gyrus, this is to of course help you with um, storing memories because it's connected to the hippocampus. So whenever you are no longer thinking clearly and you're forgetting things, everybody makes a joke that whenever you get older, you might walk into a room and you're like, why did I come in here again? I don't remember what I was here for. I mean, people think that that is just normal with aging and that's actually not. So you do want to take um, a keen awareness to those situations and just know that your brain may need some additional support. You should not be forgetting why you walked into a room. I understand it does happen, um, but it will happen more so if you're not sleeping appropriately. Now, I put on this one as well, the glymphatic system. Glymphatic system is something that is a newer theory. Um, not all researchers actually agree on the theory of the glymphatic system, but I wanted to put it in here for you guys anyways, because we talked about the glial cells, so that's where the gl comes from, the neuroglia inside of the central nervous system. Um, we have different types of supportive cells to those neurons, right? So the gl is for the glial cells, lymphatic meaning immunity, meaning clean up the body. So this glymphatic system is for the purpose of removing toxins from the brain during sleep. But what has been proposed in this theory is that this only works if you are asleep. It will not work during the day while you are awake. So you are more likely to have a higher level of toxins on your brain if you are sleep deprived or you're not sleeping enough hours in which we can clinically correlate to our Alzheimer's patients because they sleep very sporadic at random times. They don't sleep through the night. And so we can see there's a whole lot more toxin buildup on the brain of Alzheimer's patients than there are in other people. So it's very, very cool information if you look further into the glymphatic system and how it has a role in helping to cleanse your brain at nighttime while you are sleeping, okay? Um, also, biotransformation. So this biotransformation is important whenever it comes to sleep as well because supporting strong sleep habits may not only increase overall health, but also help eliminate toxins that can contribute to different patients' symptoms. So biotransformation means that we have the ability to clean up things through our organs of detoxification. Whenever you look at your kidneys and your liver, your large intestine, your lungs, even your skin, those help pull toxins out of your body. So whenever you are sleeping, those organs can work at a more efficient rate than if you are not sleeping. So very important to help you with eliminating and clearing those toxins out of your system because we're exposed to them every day. I mean, I gave you guys that assignment about the endocrine disrupting chemicals at the very beginning, and there's so many things that can cause you to have a buildup of toxins. The pollution, you guys have seen different areas of um, you know, problems that come with environmental pollution. So we have toxins all around us every single day. There's toxins in our water supply. So we, need, we definitely need to have a way to get these things out. And they're showing that sleep may be also helping with removing these from our body. Now, of course, shift workers, I gave you guys that um, assignment because so many of you are going to end up going through nursing and then you're gonna get out and you're gonna have to go to night shift because it's hard to get day shift jobs. So um, I actually just talked to one of my uh, prior students from a couple of years ago. She's in the nursing program right now, but she's been in a night shift job at Children's for a number of months now. She's actually the reason why I gave you guys the assignments that I gave you about shift work 
because I have watched her health deteriorate as she has worked night shift. So you do want to be very aware of what it will do to your body, which is why I wanted to um, give you guys an opportunity to find things that will support your system. But if you have an opportunity to take day versus night, you need to evaluate more than just the extra pay. Okay. If you are fortunate enough to have an opportunity for a day shift, don't compare the cost that you're going to pay for working night shift to what's going to be on your paycheck because the two are not going to add up. So as you can see here in 2019, they took a group of doctors and they wanted to see what happened with these doctors who had to work night shift one night of sleep loss. They had more breaks in their DNA compared to people who slept. So whenever you're looking at DNA breaks, obviously now we're getting into situations like cancer, um, metabolic syndrome, which is a whole host of things that causes your body to um, have problems in the cardiovascular system, in the endocrine system. Um, so lots of different issues with metabolic syndrome and then of course, Alzheimer's disease. So if you can do the day shift, um, do the day shift because these studies do show that just one night of sleep loss already causes your DNA to start to break and then therefore can lead to some of those chronic um, illnesses that you do not want to ever have to deal with. And then nocturia, this means nighttime urination. So although a lot of people think, well, if I just don't drink water at night, then that should help me with not going to the bathroom while I'm trying to sleep. And that's not always true. So we can't always blame it on drinking water at a particular time of the day. For some people, they may need to cut it off at a certain time um, if they're trying to overcome nocturia. But there's a whole lot of other things that we want to look at for nocturia rather than just how much water are you drinking at a particular time. So getting rid of things that are uh, diuretics, like the caffeine, the coffee, the tea, those will stop the hormones that help you with keeping your water inside. So the anti-diuretic hormone, the ADH that's released um, from the hypothalamus is actually going to help you with not peeing everything out. However, when you drink caffeine, you drink tea, you drink beer, you drink alcohol, that all inhibits ADH. And because it inhibits ADH, now you're peeing a whole lot more. So those are some other things that we need to address first because you have to have water in your system. There's no way around that. Um, so we address these things first, stop smoking, make sure you're exercising. Um, all of those things are very important. And then we can also look at what's going on in that person's cardiovascular system. Could this be an underlying sign that there is some sort of heart disease? So that's possible. For men, we can look at the prostate. So BPH stands for benign prostatic hypertrophy. And as the prostate starts to get larger, it can then cause you to have or cause them to have more incidents where they need to go pee. However, what normally happens is they can't completely empty their bladder. So they'll go pee multiple times and it'll be smaller dribbles. Um, that is definitely an indication that that prostate needs to be evaluated if they're peeing multiple times throughout the night and it's just small amounts. So what you can see here, if you have BPH and hypertension, both of these can be related to diet-induced hyperinsulinemia. That means too much insulin running inside of your bloodstream because you are eating too much sugar. And that's just not sugar in the form of cakes or pies or cookies or whatever. It's not just about desserts. Um, grains are sugar converters. So when you eat pasta and tortillas, and uh, what else, rice or bread, all of that converts to sugar. And that causes your glucose levels to rise, which will cause your insulin levels to rise. So if you change the diet, 
then we can start to see some changes in the nocturia as well. The other thing we have to be cognizant of is sleep apnea because sleep apnea, just like the beers and the coffee and the tea, it will also affect ADH. So addressing that, going in for a sleep study, seeing if that person does need to sleep with a CPAP would also be important things to look at if they are frequently peeing through the night. Okay, you guys like my little funny that I put right here? <laughs> I thought that was good. I laughed at myself when I wrote it. All right, now for some fun stuff. If we're looking at this growing body of evidence that's suggesting energy metabolism and cellular antioxidant mechanisms defending against oxidative damage, we said oxidative damage will occur with sleep deprivation. If they're coordinated by the circadian clock, then what we need to do is we need to make sure we understand how the circadian clock actually works. Now this is from traditional Chinese medicine and basically what you can see here is that this is a clock that will go for the full 24 hours of a day and it tells you at which times of the day specific organs are going to be more active. Okay, So if you're looking at um, waking up through the night and if you have the same time frame that you're always waking up through the night if you go look at the clock, let's just say, for example, it's 4 a.m. Somebody who's always waking up at 4 a.m., we can look at the clock and say, okay, that is associated with the lungs. So if that person has something like COPD, if they're a smoker, um, have asthma, anything that's associated with the respiratory system, then I want to address that in order to help address the sleep issue because we've got to get them to stay asleep. And oftentimes this waking up at the same time usually comes with, I don't know why I wake up. There's no noise. I don't need to pee. Nobody is snoring around me. My cat didn't jump on me. I have no idea why I'm waking up at this time. I just am. I'm, my eyes are open and there it is, I'm awake. Um, so that's whenever I like to go to this clock is whenever we can't figure out other things that may be the reason for waking up. The other thing is, is that once you start to learn a little bit more about um, traditional Chinese medicine, if that's something you want to do, um, obviously you will not learn that through school. But if you do, um, there are all different types of emotions associated with different organs. So the emotion associated with lungs is grief. So if it's not a patient who has any respiratory issues and we can't find anything underlying, then I can go to the emotional side of the triangle and we can start talking about any issues that may be causing them to experience grief. Did someone just die? Did you just lose your job? Are you struggling as a parent? All of those things actually will start to come out. And if it's an emotional thing, then we have to address that in order to help them sleep. So it's not an Ambien and it's not, you know, a melatonin. It's we have to get to the root and get to the underlying cause of what's really going on. So that's why the TCM clock is um, super, super cool. Okay. Um, what else? What else can we do? Lots of things. So if we can't look at the TCM clock and figure something out, oh, by the way, if they say, well, I wake up like every two hours. So it's not just one time, it's repetitively through the night that repetitively through the night is definitely a blood sugar issue. That has to be a diet change because they're constantly waking up because the sugar is causing them to get up um, as their insulin is dropping the glucose level so low. So if you have a lot of sugar inside of your uh, blood, the insulin is going to come and it'll pull the glucose out of your bloodstream. And whenever that happens, generally your body will get a signal that it's time for you to eat. And so sometimes the waking up throughout the night is that constant signal of your glucose is low, you should, you should eat something. Um, so of course some people struggle and then they will get up and they will go and eat. And then this perpetuates the whole you know, fluctuation of glucose and insulin. So that's not what we wanna do. We want to address what they're eating throughout the day in order to help maintain those good blood sugar levels. Um, and if they're addicted to sweets, then we have to um, do some things to help address that. But 
whenever they are getting ready to go to bed. For those particular patients who have blood sugar issues, I will say take um, a small bit of food that's really high in protein and fat, very low in glucose, and have that like an hour or so before bed. That's coming up on the next slide, but that's very important for those uh, particular patients. So assessing the mattress, sleeping in a certain temperature, very important because if you're not sleeping um, in a temperature within this range, your body may get too hot and it will wake up. You should be colder at night. Total darkness, meaning turn off all of the computers, turn off all of the, um, the blue lights that can come from your television. All of that is very, very important. And then wake to light. What that means is when you get up, you should open your blinds. If you open your blinds and it's still dark outside, then spend some time in, in the sun, in the natural light during the day, because that's gonna help set your circadian rhythm to the appropriate cues. If you're inside all day and there's no windows where you're at, then your body isn't getting the cues of it's now 6 p.m., it's now 8 p.m. So the circadian clock is very dependent upon natural light. Very important. Um, PMR is progressive muscle relaxation. Progressive muscle relaxation is very easy to do. It costs absolutely nothing. And very often is incredibly helpful for people or EFT is emotional freedom technique. If it is some underlying emotional thing that we discovered, um, maybe needs to be addressed. Emotional freedom technique, also free. Very easy to do, very easy for people to learn. There are free apps that will help with making sure that that brain is calm. So for that person who feels like they have a thousand things going on in their side of their brain, when they get ready to lay down and go to sleep and they take a very long time to fall asleep because you should not take longer than 15 minutes. 15 minutes is the max. And if you're taking longer than 15 minutes to fall asleep, something isn't correct. So you wanna address that. Okay, so there are apps to help that person who feels like they have a thousand thoughts at once. Essential oil blends, there are plenty out there that are created for sleep and that will help with getting that person to kind of relax and go to sleep. Um, do not use your bed for anything other than sleep or sex is a very important one. If people are in the bed and they're eating in bed, they're watching TV in bed, they're studying in bed, they're working in bed, they're doing Zoom in their bed, that's letting your body know that this is the time to do something other than sleep because this is where you always do it at. And if you always study inside of your bed, and you have trouble sleeping, it's because your body is thinking, well, this is where we study. So you have to kind of transition and teach your body that that's not what we do in the bed. These are the only two things that we do in the bed. Um, incorporating feng shui principles in your home. So that is a very interesting concept. And it basically is all about, you know, like energy um, throughout the home. There are certain principles, like one of the feng shui principles for the bedroom is you're not even supposed to have a TV in your room at all. Again, that goes back to sleep and sex in the bedroom. Um, you close certain doors. There's lots of stuff that goes into feng shui. I won't go into all of that. That's easy to Google. Um, but some people actually feel better whenever they kind of incorporate some of those principles. Exercise midday, not getting up at 5 a.m., struggling to get out of bed because you're tired to exercise or exercising at 8 p.m. because then your brain is stimulated and it makes you want to stay awake. So midday is really the best time. It's keeping a consistent schedule, even on the weekends. Some people need to keep a journal because they get all these bright ideas, especially right brain people. And so they just want to think about all of these things and talk about this and be creative in this. And so um, keeping that journal so they, that that way those things can come out of the brain and onto a piece of paper. And then there's different supplements that I put down here. CBD is uh, definitely one of my favorite because it does help relax the brain. It helps with um, fighting oxidative damage. And then it also is really good for any type of anxiety, depression. So those people who have a thousand thoughts a minute, uh, CBD is very helpful for helping them to go to sleep as well. Chart your progress. 
talk to your doctor about a sleep study if needed. And then you see over here, meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong, mindfulness, yoga, all of these things are also um, being studied right now to see how helpful they are for sleeping. And then nutrition. Obviously, there's a lot of um, things on here for nutrition because you guys know that's what I love. Um, but there's so many different things that you can do throughout your day that you don't even realize will make an impact at night. So everybody um, generally will focus on the, well, what can I do at nighttime to sleep better? And sometimes it's what you're actually doing in the morning when you get up and what you're doing throughout your day that's making your, your sleep um, not a good long quality sleep. So lots of different ideas. And then I put this website for you guys down here. WH Foods stands for World's Healthiest Foods. And this website I love. It is phenomenal the way this man has put this website together because he has a hundred foods. He will talk about how each one made the list of world's healthiest. And it's stuff that you could easily go find at the grocery store. It's not loaded up with a whole bunch of stuff that you're like, what is that? I don't, I don't know where to go find a goji berry, okay? It's things that you would eat. He has recipes on there. Um, and anytime you feel like, I need to have more magnesium in my life, or I need more calcium in my life, or I need more vitamin B12 in my life, you can go onto his website, put in what you need, zinc, type it in the search box, and it'll throw up the throw up. That's probably not a good thing to say with food. It will pull up all of the different foods that are highest in that particular nutrient. So that way you can then kind of focus on eating those in a higher quantity to help you with whatever it is that you're looking for. Biotin for the hair. So biotin will help with hair growth. And you can find foods that are high in biotin in order to kind of incorporate those if that's your goal. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that. I know I'll walk through that pretty quickly, but um, you guys will have this. I'll post this on Canvas, so that way you will still have access to it if you want to go back and look at anything. But any questions that you guys have about any of it? I think I have one question about um, what if a person, okay, say so what if a person sleeps really well? Uh huh. But they, no matter what time they go to sleep, they can go to sleep at 2 a.m. or 10 o'clock p.m. and will still wake up exactly at the same time every day feeling completely rested. Is that still a problem that they're not getting this certain amount of sleep? Not right now, but it will be later on. So they may not experience any of the negative effects at this point in time, but because of the lack of hours, like if they go to sleep at 2 a.m., because of the lack of hours, what you're doing is you're actually causing some issues within that circadian rhythm. If you go to sleep by 10.30 p.m., you should be in stage four sleep by midnight. And one of the things that should happen if you're in stage four by midnight is that you'll release growth hormone, which is very repairing and healing to the system. If you go to sleep at 2 a.m., you don't get that hormone. So even though you may feel okay, feelings aren't facts, even though you may feel okay, it is eventually going to catch up to you because now you've distorted different um, circadian processes that should occur at specific times of the day. So you can't do that forever. Like if you need, you know, a season, let's say you're in a new season of life, moms who have babies, obviously their sleep gets incredibly and you're not thrown off whenever they're going through that. So the goal is always, how do I support myself through this particular time period? What can I do, like food stuff? What can I start to incorporate more of? Brain healthy things, what can I do for that? Um, stress reduction, all of those things are very important as you go through that season with the goal and the intention of, I'm gonna get better at going to bed at this particular time when I can cross the stage or whatever it is, when my kid is one, whatever. So that's the tricky thing about sleep is that sometimes people will feel like, like my husband used to say all the time when I met him, he used to tell me, I don't need a lot of sleep. 
give me four or five, maybe six hours max. And that's, I'm good. Like I'm golden. I work well in that. But the problem is, is now he's worked his body to the very thinnest thread. And now whenever something small comes in, now it takes him down a whole lot easier because he hasn't repaired for years because he always thought oh, I was fine on just a short, short bit of sleep, but you can't see what's actually happening to your insides, which is the problem with sleep. You can't see it sometimes until it's too late. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. It's, my husband, I was asking him for he, Yeah. He specifically, he does exactly what your husband did. Yeah. So now that I have gotten him to realize, okay, for example, he, once I met him, changed his whole diet. I had to fix a whole lot of things. Okay. So once I fixed everything and he did everything that I said, except for the sleep thing, he was a whole lot better. Didn't need his asthma pump. Didn't have hay fever at the same time every single year. No longer got the boils on the back of his head whenever he would go get his hair cut. All of that changed. But he hasn't been sleeping. Guess who now has to use the asthma pump? Well, the only thing that has come is a little bit of change of weather. You should have been able to deal with that change of weather, but you haven't been sleeping. So now it's going to take your respiratory system longer to recover because you have all of this stuff that hasn't been repairing and regenerating. You haven't used the asthma pump in five years plus, and now you need a new prescription for it. You see what I'm saying? So like you can't just look at what you feel like the next day because it's coming since it's cumulative. Yes, ma'am? Um, so how do you know that you are getting quality sleep? So that's a good question. So on that um, right here, chart your progress. There's a couple of different ways that you can do that. If you have like a, a watch that will basically look at your sleep time, look at your sleep patterns, tell you when you're awake. So having that watch that will actually personally do it for you. There are, I believe, a couple of mattresses that embed it now. And that's technology inside of the mattress. So that way you can actually see if you are sleeping. I know there's some apps on the phone. The only thing is, is I just hate for people to sleep with their phone nearby them. That's the, the thing that I really hate the most. Um, so I guess I have to take that lie back because my husband also will not take the phone away from his head either. But your phone should not be beside your head. If there's another way you can do it, then I would say do it in that particular way. The other thing you can do is just journal it. I slept from this time to this time, and whenever I woke up, this is how I felt. And then these are the things that happened to me throughout my day. Did you get headaches? Did you have a problem with constipation? You know, like whatever. So it's a couple of different ways that you can do it. Um, some a little bit more techy than others, but you can go old school if you want and just write your notes. So, so to an extent, you can count on your feeling. Like if I feel good throughout the day, then yeah. Yeah, to an extent, you can't necessarily always count on that because yeah. then that's whenever you get into the, um, well, I slept for five hours. Yeah, I feel good. I feel fine um, because of the cumulative effects like I was talking about with her. So that's great. I mean, if you wake up and you feel good and all of that's wonderful. But again, if we're looking also at like the lymphatic theory, as they start to learn more about that, you may feel great, but... 10 years down the road, if you have a ton of toxins built up on the brain because it hasn't been able to clear, now what are you going to feel like? So this is um, the reason why functional medicine doctors address sleep at the level that they do because ultimately it's about how are you going to function long term for, you know, the whole life and what will be the quality of it, not just the quantity of it. And it's so funny that I, you know, I hear all these things from patients and I, I learn all kinds, I learn things from everybody. It doesn't matter who they are, but I had one patient who came in and um, he went to the Cooper Clinic. Are you guys familiar with Cooper Clinic? So it's like a fancy pants, you know, clinic where you can go in and you can get taken care of by, 
my fancy pants people. Um, so he went to the Cooper Clinic and he got like full, full physical, full blood work. He got in the pool. They measured with fat calipers while he was underwater. Like he did the whole nine. And then once he got all of his reports back, he basically met with his doctor and his doctor said, now look, I'm gonna use a different name. I'm not gonna use his real name. So he said, now look, Doug, these are all of the things that you have going on. You're obese, your heart is not working like it should, your blood pressure is off. Obviously, whenever we're looking at um, obesity and heart issues, then we also have to think about diabetics. So you're pre-diabetic, You've got this whole long list. He just da -da 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 and he said, "You have one of two options. Option number one, I can put you on a whole host of prescription pills, and those prescription pills will basically combat all of the long lists that I just gave you. But the problem is they'll come with side effects, and with those side effects, you'll come back to me and you'll want more prescription pills." And then it'll just keep going in that realm. We'll just keep going back and forth between what is actually helping and now what's causing more side effects. He said, I can keep you alive with the power of modern medicine. I can keep you alive forever, like until you're 100. And then you'll feel like crap probably for the last 30 years of your life. Your quantity will be great because I'm going to keep you alive with these pills, but your quality is going to suck. So option number two would be you change your diet, you get the sleep you need, you make sure that you are exercising, and he, so, he starts going through this list, but all of these are choices that have to be made every single day. So really it's about what do you wanna do? Do you want me to give you the pills or do you wanna make all of the choices? And he said, I'm out of here, I'm not gonna do this. And so that's why he found himself in my office and he was like, so you tell me what to do and what choices to make, and I'm going to make those choices. The thing is, is that it's hard sometimes for people to make those choices every single day. And so even though this seems like there's a lot of things that you have to do, sometimes in order to get good quality sleep, you have to realize at the end of the day, long term, will it be worth it to you? And that's really a question that everybody has to answer on their own. Some people are like, no, I don't care. And uh, I'm going to die regardless of just getting the pills. And that's, that's, that's your prerogative. So if that's what you choose to do, then that's what you choose to do. That's your choice to make. Some people will be like, I'll do whatever you need me to do in order to, uh, you know, help have a good, long quality of life. Because different people are in, in, in different thought patterns. So. It may seem like there's a lot whenever it comes to sleep, but you just have to think long term. And I think that's the hardest part also for um, for us as Americans, <laughs> where we live in a microwave society and everybody wants what they want right now. And we got to change it to like a slow cooker mentality. You know, it's going to take us a while to get there, but it's going to be super delicious and super wonderful once we finally do. So any other questions that you guys have? Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Yes, okay. I was gonna ask about like napping. The, like, even just like an hour or two in the middle of the day, how, how beneficial is that really? So, some studies show that it actually is very beneficial to take a nap during the day. And the, the problem with that comes in whenever you look at people who, if they take a nap during the day, they wake up and they feel like crap for the rest of the day. So if that's you, then I just say, well, then just don't take a nap, okay? Um, for those people who 15 minutes and I feel super refreshed, okay, then great. Take that moment to take a break, take a nap, if that works for you. So everybody is different, but as far as I know, yes, there are some benefits to that. Um, and then even some cultures that, you know, they close down businesses and society at certain times of the day so everybody can go take a nap. So, so nice. yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, when I wake up from a nap, I feel awful. Like, yeah. I'm not caught and I can't. Yeah. At all. Like, at night time, whatever time it is, during the day, I can't take a nap. Yeah, so that would be the other thing is that um, if there, because you have those two different people, some who wake up feeling great, some who wake up feeling terrible, if you wake up feeling great, but it pushes your bedtime, then then I would say don't do it. 
So even if you feel okay, if it's going to cause you to go to bed later, then that is going to eventually catch up with you as well. Yes, ma'am? I have a question about um, snacking because the lyrics said that snacking should happen several hours before going to bed. Mm -hmm. What do you mean dinner several hours before bed? But from what I what I've heard about snacking before bed, it usually comes in cravings. So either it'll be a strong salty craving or a strong sweet craving. But you don't get either of those with natural foods. So should those just be? Should you just avoid snacking altogether and just not? try to feed this impulse your body is having, just deal with it? Or so, is there a way to? So there is there is a way around it. So whenever you're looking at like the sweet foods, once somebody goes through a program, like a detoxification program or something like that um, for three to four weeks, once they get out of that program, those sweet cravings get satisfied by things like peaches and grapes and stuff like that. It, and sometimes it's even almost too sweet for them. So that's actually what has to be fixed is what is the cause of the craving? So that's what we need to kind of get to. For the sweets, if it is pure sweets, like I want candy, I want Sour Patch Kids, I want a brownie, anything like that, um, you want to basically look at what is that person eating throughout the day? Are they getting enough protein and fat? Because sometimes it's the sweet craving that's coming from my body feels like it doesn't have enough glucose. Um, and then also for the salty, that's usually related back to the adrenal glands. So taking care of your adrenal glands, which need a whole lot of vitamin C, very important for those reasons. Um, but the saltiness could come from things like um, uh oh what's the name there is a flower cassava flower and so they have crunchy chips the cassava flower um that has some salt on it so that's actually a healthier snack than going in there and getting something that's just going to you know completely blow any type of goals that you have especially if they're weight loss goals they're better than lace too <laughs> they're better than lace oh, yeah oh yeah and then um, I think they changed the name from Benito to Beanfield. I think Beanfield is now the name of the chips that are made from white beans. And they actually have a sea salt flavor that's very tasty. So you can find healthier snacks in the sweet and salty area. I wouldn't say just ignore it. Your body is always trying to tell you something. And so whenever you get those cues, you want to figure out what is it that it's trying to tell me. If it's cravings for chocolate, sometimes you're deficient in magnesium. So what I have also noted from patients is if you think you want a snack, if you'll just go into the kitchen, take like a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar, give it like 20 minutes and see if you still want a snack. Because sometimes that will completely change it. You know, I know people sometimes say, oh, drink some water and see if that's... I don't find that water changes it as much as the apple cider vinegar does. Obviously, from your face, you look like, no, I would just rather go without the snack. <laughs> <laughs> so just like a teaspoon and water? You can do a teaspoon straight, just like straight out of the little teaspoon thing, or you can put it in water if you want. Mm -hmm. I came up with a theory right when she said that, because whenever I've tried doing an apple cider vinegar thing for a uh -huh. while, uh -huh. And the only reason why I feel like I don't want to eat after it is because I feel like I have to throw up for about 30 minutes after doing it. Really? Like, oh, it feels terrible. like, because it hurts your stomach or? It just, you know, you get that feeling like, ugh. I can taste it, I can smell it. It's just, ugh. Oh, okay. So it's like, it's changing it's your desire for food. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't like it. Gotcha. I mean, okay. I understand it's good for you. just don't like it. Yeah. It is good for you. But yeah, so I wouldn't say ignore it. I would say try to maybe dig a little bit deeper and see what your body is trying to tell you. But this would be everybody. Uh, as far as everybody in my house, but at least everyone has late night cravings. So really? So the, what I have found, this is just me personally, this may not even help you at all, but what I have found is if we have a dinner that is on the lighter side, like one of our very favorite things to eat at home is, um, a salmon pasta salad. If we don't have enough salmon 
on our salad, it's like everybody's hungry in like two hours. And so then people are back in the kitchen and it's because they're not satiated to begin with. So on those particular days, what I started doing was now we have yogurt for dessert after we have the salmon pasta salad. Like, um, so delicious makes the coconut yogurt because I don't really like to do like regular yogurts just just because my belly doesn't like it. But key lime pie flavor, it's like you're eating a piece of pie, you know. But that that seemed to change that for us. So you may just look and see like what are we eating at dinner time, and is everybody still hungry because the calorie count is so low in those particular situations. That may help. Any other questions? You guys always ask such good questions. Uh, Are you debating your questions? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, like, if I'm really stressed out, mm -hmm. usually I can't sleep for a couple of days or whatever it is, and then it'll catch up to me and I can sleep yeah. all throughout the night. Mm -hmm. But I noticed when I, like just on my own, when I get some good sleep, I'll probably wake up 7 o'clock, 7.30, and then I'll go to bed around 9, 10, something like that. But mm -hmm. if I don't stay on that schedule, my stomach hurts all the time. Okay, yes. So whenever it comes to um, sleep irregularities, the other thing that can happen is, remember how we have the enteric nervous system in our gut? Whenever you are sleeping irregularly, because there's so many neurons in your gut, um, if you have problems with gut issues from sleep issues, whether that's constipation, diarrhea, just overall bloated, not feeling well, that's because of the, that connection between our central nervous system, our first brain, and then our ENS, our second brain. So it is common to have GI disturbances in people who have sleep deficiencies or sleep irregularities. What can you do about it? I mean, obviously, if you're stressed, which is why you're not sleeping, that's what you have to address kind of up front. CBD is my preference for those people whenever they have stressors that they necessarily can't change, so to speak. The CBD will use the receptors in the brain and in the gut to kind of help calm you. So that should also ease not just the stress to help you sleep, but also ease some of the stomach issues as well. But like for the longest time I had, and my stomach would kill me if I drank, say, a sip of soda or something. Right. I don't drink soda anymore, mm -hmm. but it would make me feel terrible. Like my mm -hmm. stomach would get bloated and I had a, what's that test you have done where they put the blue stuff through a, a deal and uh, uh, put it over a scanner. The dye? The dye. It's a blue dye or something. You like had that. an MRI or something? Yeah, they put it in there and then okay. you can see it. Uh -huh. And they gave me some kind of medicine for my stomach and it never helped. Like, yeah. I could never, ever get rid of the, the yeah. stomach pains. So the other thing with stomach, because there are so many different bacteria in each individual's body, um, Whenever you look at like probiotics and things of that nature, a lot of people will talk about taking probiotics, which I mean, that's fine, but there's so many different strains of bacteria that are there to help your microbiome run like it should. Whenever you're eating foods that are rich in probiotics, like the yogurt and sauerkraut, kimchi, things of that nature, um, that will also sometimes help with alleviating some of those issues as well, because sometimes it's just a, a good versus bad bacteria situation that gets thrown for a loop whenever you aren't sleeping or you are stressed. Stress will do that to you for sure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can you oversleep? Is it? Can you oversleep? Yes. So you can oversleep um, for people who have depression and other types of neurological deficits, sometimes they do oversleep. And so really it's a matter of you have to get out of the bed and you have to keep your body active. So just laying there and not allowing your body to go through 
the processes that it should because you want to just sleep all day. Some of those patients are 12, 14 hours. Like that is too much. So it is best to stay somewhere between like that seven to eight and a half ish, nine range, but really not go beyond that for an adult. Now for a kid, it's totally different. They should sleep more because as their body is growing, there's a lot of changes that are going to occur. So baby, it's fine for a baby to sleep pretty much all day. Not fine for an adult. Yeah. What else? All right. So let's do the review for this test. Okay. So for your test, Basically, as I give you this review, well, first let me give my uh, disclaimer for the review. Disclaimer is that whenever I made this review, if I happen to forget a few things, then just understand this is probably like 90% of the test, but there may be some questions that pop up that you're like, oh, I don't remember that being on the review. Okay, that's because I'm a human being. So that's my disclaimer. This is probably about 90% of the test. Um, remember as I go through this review also that every day, Monday through Thursday, all of the questions on the paper portion are going to be different for every single class. So some of the things that I'm going to say on here are from also paper portion and it may not be on your particular class, but I'm just giving everybody the same review, not class specific. So. Um, I said that because a lot of professors don't give reviews because people then complain about them. And that's definitely the fastest way to end test reviews is to complain to me, complain to someone else, complain and it comes back to me. So just keep that in mind as you get ready to study. Okay, may not be 100% of the exam. So I'm doing this starting with chapter 12. And what I did was I went through the PowerPoints in order to um, make this review to highlight to you guys the things that you definitely want to make sure that you are studying and that you know. So it goes in order of the PowerPoint. Know the different divisions of the nervous system. And there is a summation slide for this in that chapter 12 PowerPoint is slide 14. That will basically summarize all of the different divisions of the nervous system for you. Know the different types of sensory receptors and their functions. Know the functions of the different neuroglia. Understand the neural responses to injuries. Understand the various steps in an action potential. And then what would happen if any of those steps were interfered with? So going back to look at that um, graph that shows you where you're at on your resting membrane potential, threshold, depolarization, repolarization, what channels are open, what channels are closed, um, all of that would be very important because if you get a question that says, well, what would happen if this was blocked or that didn't work appropriately, you want to understand how action potentials work in the different parts of the neuron that are going to be involved in that. So that way you can answer those types of questions. Okay. Know the difference in the types of propagation. And then know the events that are going to occur at a cholinergic synapse. Events are going to happen. Yes, the events that occur at a cholinergic synapse. So that's chapter 12. Anybody have any questions on chapter 12? It's another 50 question test, right? So it'll be, will it be 25, 25 or? Oh, um, so chapter 12 is 10 questions. Okay. Chapter 
14 on the brain is going to be 25, and the spinal cord is 15. So as you're studying, the other thing that I would say is whenever you're looking at the material, make sure that you're able to um, comprehend the material because there's not going to be a whole lot of what we would call primary questions. So primary question is just a straightforward question. It's like a memorization thing. Okay. Like where would you find the Arbor Vitae? Answer cerebellum. That's primary. That's straightforward. But these are going to be more of application type questions. So that way it's more clear that you understand how does the neuron work or how does the brain work or how does the spinal cord work. Okay, so there will be some primary, um, but it's not going to be the whole test. Okay, for the brain, there are no questions on the embryological development or the fetal brain. Definitely make sure you look at the summation slide, slide 12 in PowerPoint A1 that I told you guys to make sure you marked because that particular slide will have the different parts of the brain um, and what those different parts will actually do. So again, you wanna be able to do a clinical correlation question. So if something were to happen to that particular part of the brain, like what would you expect to see go wrong? Things like that. Understand the different functions of the brain in certain areas like the motor cortex, the sensory cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the integrative centers. Make sure you know the differences in the brain waves. and know a few examples of foods that can help with nourishing the brain. Okay, that's A1. So in B1, still on the brain, make sure you know the three different types of fibers, the white fibers. Understand the function of the basal nuclei and the limbic system. Know about the importance of the hormone secreted by the pineal gland. What hormone is that? Melatonin. Melatonin, yeah. Know the general function of the thalamus. There are lots of thalamic nuclei. Um, there was lots of information about the thalamus. Just know in general, what does the thalamus do? Okay. What does the thalamus do? What's the general? Sensory Yes. So all of the sensory information has to go through the thalamus, except for what? Smell. Smell. Perfect. Okay. So you already know that. Look at slide 21 for the functions of the hypothalamus. And then know the general, again, general functions of the three parts of the brainstem. Okay, that's B1 going on to C1. Know the general function of the cerebellum and then what would go wrong if there are disorders in the cerebellum. Understand the purpose of the cranial meninges and how they differ from the spinal meninges.
understand the role of the ventricular system in the brain and the purpose of CSF? Ventricular one. The ventricular system. And then the purpose of CSF. Look back at your blood supply to the brain and then what could happen if that is interfered with. Okay, that's all brain. Questions on brain? Spinal cord. Make sure you review your spinal cord drawing so that you are familiar with the structures that we talked about as well as their functions. There are two pictures on the test that are going to be related to the spinal cord drawing itself. Understand dermatomes. Know the difference between peripheral neuropathy, radiculopathy, and radiculitis. Peripheral, what was the yeah. uh, Sorry, peripheral neuropathy, radiculopathy, and radiculitis. Radiculitis. No, this is the first one. Oh, radiculopathy. Mm -hmm. R A D I C U L O P A T H Y. And then do you want me to the other one? Radiculitis. Huh? Radiculitis. So uh, may I interrupt and ask a question? Yeah. So this brings to point. Um, are all of the 50 questions that are multiple choice, will they be again? taken from the question bank uh, in the book, are you? So you, I'm doing the whole review for what you would find on Pearson as as well as the paper. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. So yeah. This is not going to show up yeah. on Pearson. Yeah. All right. Got it. No, Pearson right. and paper. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So you said these are going to come from Pearson? No, not all of them. The, the whole review is for Pearson and paper. Um, yeah. Okay. Know your major nerves for each of the four plexuses. And then know the different components within the reflex arc. And that spinal cord. Okay. Any questions? Perfecto. All right, so I will see you guys. Yes, I will.